excuse me. Could one of you just check that the camera is recording? It's a red light, okay. <clears throat> then it's okay. Okay, types of, uh, of supply chain risks. Um, <clears throat> because one thing is to, to describe the four factors uh, or the four components in a, in a kind of a risk assessment. Uh, but we need to break down uh, the risk concept onto factors that can be measured in a way. So if you if you consider the, the middle part here, this is almost the same as this uh, this uh, illustration that I showed you next uh, the last time with the focal firm here, and you have suppliers in this direction and customers in this direction. So what is called organization here is the is the focal firm, and. Um, now, uh, we see here connected to the suppliers environment and the, and the suppliers including outsourcing of uh, or offshoring of uh, manufacturing we see here there are certain risk factors that are listed relationships long distance relationships may not be too successful supplier performance risk Human resource risk, are people as skilled as they, uh, they claim to be, or is there any problems? Disruption risk, it's connected to the transport network. Uh, environment risk, uh, that may have to do with, uh, with uh, business cultures and, and, and the like. Uh, market dynamics, uh, disaster which is, uh, can easily be translated to, to, uh, to floods, flooding and, uh, and strong weather of any kind. Political and country risk, we have talked about that. Supplier financial risk, if somebody goes bust, what do you do then? And regulatory risk, <coughs> like coping with uh, national regulations, uh, European Union regulations and, and the like. So, addressing these issues in, uh, in thoroughly when you, when you are going to set up an international relationship is important. Some of them may be trivial and not relevant, but, uh, but it's good to go, go through the whole, um, the whole uh, set of, of factors. When it comes to the, to the focal firm, there are slightly different types of risk. You have the operational risk <coughs> connected to, uh, to your, uh, your, uh, your production. Um, we don't call it operational risk on, on this side. We call it more supplier performance risk, right? But it is embedded in the supplier performance risk, the operational risk at the suppliers. <coughs> Technical risk. Uh, Maybe everything from uh, from uh, from breakdown of equipment, and to actually the risk of uh, not being able to cope with the customer's demand in in technical terms. I mean, you cannot. You you are often, uh, at least in speci in uh, in specific industries, engaged in in engineering to order production. We are often, at least when we talk about uh, uh, offshore operations, oil and gas operations, you are operating at the limit of what you can uh, achieve in technological terms. Um, financial risk <coughs> has to do with uh, with. Uh, you can see a simple thing is uh, is how the interest rate of your uh, of your loans will develop in the future. Uh, legal risk, reg regulatory risk, 
can be connected to if you need to uh, adjust your production according to new new legal legal uh, um, regulations. For instance, when it comes to uh, the level of emissions from your production or, uh, or anything like that. Environment risk. Uh, again, it may be connected to uh, environment in this case is often interpreted as the business environment, as I told you here. And not so much on the, on the external environment like, uh, like clean air and all that kind of stuff, because that is handled in many cases in, within, this, uh, within this framework. Uh, or here on technical side. Human relations, health and safety risk has to do with uh, with uh, life and limb issues on at the production site for the for the employees, and they have the same the political country risk here as well, which may be less here of course when you are uh, addressing the core business in a, in, a, in in a country where whereas you are need, need to to address that more closely if you are going to for instance source from from another country in another part of the world the customers environment <coughs> i mean financial financial risk is relevant there as well if uh, if your customer uh, goes bust it goes without saying that that has some consequences um, especially if you are tied up, or not tied up, but, but you are, you have a linkage with one or a few customers, because that may may be a case for uh, for uh, if you are a supplier and your customer is uh, is a big, or you are sort of putting all your eggs in one basket and and uh, and selling to one customer. If they go bust, it's, it's a problem. But if you have many customers and one of them goes, it's not perhaps that big, of, uh, that uh, much of an issue. Distribution risk, <coughs> that has to do with a with, uh, with logistic network. Relationship risk, uh, again, very simple example. I mean, if they change uh, the CEO, the director, is replaced with another person. You need to build up new relationships. I, I know that is a risk because I have been in that position myself. When uh, because when it, <coughs> when uh, one of our uh, customers at the research center changed their uh, manager, we needed to uh, to put some effort into establishing a new relationship. That has to do with, of course, with uh, managing to, to keep up the activities and to, to keep the customer, uh, even if they change uh, management. Market risk goes a bit along the same. <coughs> Brand reputation risk. One example from the airline industry recently. It's Norwegian Air Shuttle with a long distance flights to uh, Far East and, and the United States. When they bought a new type of aircraft from, uh, from Boeing in the United States and they suffer from technical problems. So the brand reputation risk is, also, uh, is on the airline side, but it's also of course on the, on the aircraft producers side here. <coughs> and then you have the same, more or less the same issues on this side. But it's it's very useful, I think, to 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 break down this this picture into what you will end up if you are going to do research on this. It's a set of variables that you are going to uh, where you need to collect data to do an analysis of how this uh, how this looks like. For instance, if you are going to, if you are <coughs> sitting in a, in a company in Norway and you are going to sell 
to to a specific customer in uh, in uh, in another country, for instance, you may want to collect information <coughs> about some of these, at least the most relevant of these uh, these uh, factors, to to find out whether you should uh, go go on with the relationship, or uh, on, and if so, is there anything that should be done? to reduce some of the risk factors, for instance, connected to the, to the distribution system. <coughs> to manage risk, talked a bit about this already, but <coughs> you can do it in various ways. You can try, avoid, try to avoid risk. Uh, meaning that you you have a, a plan for uh, for uh, eliminate the possibility of an event, improving the maintenance efforts on the on the network or whatever. Or you can you can have a a situation where you can uh, you can have agreement with two carriers. If one of them goes, you can use the other one, and the customer won't notice this at all. Transfer. Of risk. Do you know uh, another word for that? This one. Yeah. Yes. You can. You can actually uh, transfer some of the risk by outsourcing activities. You can transfer, uh, let's say, risk connected to uh, capital investments and, and the like. But the word I was thinking of was a slightly different one, but, uh, but I agree, you can, uh, you can also uh, affect uh, risk by transfer, uh, by outsource activities. I was thinking about insurance. <coughs> when you buy yourself, uh, an, or if you use, spend money on an insurance pre premium, you actually shift risk to a third party. So when you are uh, insuring against uh, your uh, car crash or something, uh, you pay a certain amount of money and you get, uh, and if something happens, you, you have the insurance company as a third party. And they again hedge against risk by, by insuring their funding in, in others. So they spread the risk uh, th uh, through many, many uh, layers or tires. We don't have to go into the insurance business, but that is one way. But I agree that uh, outsourcing can shift, shift risk between parties here. Mitigate. Um, well, the parallel transport system is kind of a, uh, a mitigation uh, measure. Um, but um, uh, you can have an action uh, that needs to be taken, for instance, to shift suppliers if if one of them uh, are not able to able to deliver. Minimize <coughs> um, could be an example of that could be to, for instance, postpone a shipment if you see that something is going to happen or is likely to happen. It can be as simple as uh, avoiding uh, as, uh, transfer by, by, uh, by seagoing vessels or, or by air if bad weather is coming. That is actually not much of an issue in, uh, in, uh, in this country, believe it or not, as compared to other parts in the world where they actually uh, do that to, 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 so, to some extent. To respond, that is the plan B issue. That you, uh, you, uh, you have uh, decided what to do if something goes, uh, goes wrong. Uh, if you are delayed to, to, uh, when supplying something to a customer, you have also a plan B to, to uh, to bring the necessary people with you to unload, simple as that. That is a very simple example. But you have thought out actions on beforehand. 
Monitoring is a very important uh, operation to do. Um, I mean, if, if you see that something is underway, that can be monitoring of weather, it can be monitoring of uh, financial conditions and situations for your uh, suppliers or customers. It can be monitoring on quality, of, uh, of uh <coughs> reliability and so on and so forth. So monitoring is crucial. It should be perhaps be put on the top here because monitoring is, uh, is a starting point for doing all the other actions here. But of course you can live with the risk. Choose to live with the risk. But all these, all these points have costs and benefits connected to them. So you can actually, by having uh, a sufficient amount of data, you can do a cost-benefit analysis here to see whether you should care to monitor a specific uh, factor, whether you should actually accept to live with the risk instead of do all kinds of uh, steps to, to, uh, to avoid it. You can, uh, you, you, should, uh, you can do a cost-benefit analysis to, to see whether you should outsource or, uh, or, uh, or buy a risk, uh, an insurance premium to hedge against risk and so on. This is just a very simple illustration to show that uh, <coughs> a typical impact if something happens. You can uh, easily think of a, a disruption in the transport network or a fire or anything. You may have gotten some early, early signals that something is going to happen. Uh, you have the, the event taking place here and then you may end up not necessarily down here but for, uh, for illustrative purposes you have a uh, development in performance, which is strongly negative here. And then, so you, you reach the full impact and then a recovery again, hopefully. But not necessarily. I mean, if it's sufficiently bad, you know, may not, you may end up here with a, with a bankruptcy or anything. <coughs> so, some examples of, of mitigating uh, disruptions. Uh, a product strategy is to, to actually uh, change the configurations of a product if you, if you uh, face a disruption like, for instance, a fire in a, in a, in a production plant at your suppliers. This is a real, real world example, which is quite well known. Where Nokia was very early, they were very, they were monitoring the situation closely. They discovered that this fire took place, and immediately they changed uh, product uh, configurations. <coughs> and whereas uh, Sony Ericsson or Ericsson at the time, the other big Swedish mobile phone producer. They, uh, they were left behind with a fortnight, two weeks, before they were able to, to catch up again. And they lost quite a lot on that. Changing suppliers if, uh, if bankruptcy occurs. And affecting demand, as I told you on one of the earlier lectures, that you can actually also in influence demand by using, for instance, the price mechanism to make the customer shift demand to other, other products. Uh, <coughs> postponement. Um, using a postponement strategy uh, where, you, where you have uh, produced a lot of, uh, of components and you assemble them to order when the customer's orders are placed. 
And if you have a design that allows the same components to serve different, different purposes. I mean, if you buy a high-spec or a low-spec computer, lots of the components are common. But you can uh, add on different, uh, different components and get, uh, get different uh, output or performance. Strategic stock. Uh, this, is, uh, this is often, in many cases, necessary. To, to, uh, to avoid shortage, if, and that is uh, an increasing need when you engage into long uh, logistics chains, long transport chains. Uh, flexibility in the supply base, <coughs> is, uh, I've talked about that. And finally, you have uh, this uh, option of, uh, of, uh, of make and buy, where you can uh, outsource production of basic items and, uh, and keep the, the high-end items in-house. Uh, it's not a simple answer to how you should distribute between in-house and outsourcing uh, decisions. It's, uh, that is a case-specific topic. And uh, currently, there is uh, there is uh, at least one master thesis that is written here on 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 outsourcing versus uh, versus producing uh, in house. And that is uh, that is about transport services. And it is actually uh, this uh, work is commissioned by one of the ship owners that are located here in this in this country to to study. Uh, how they should uh, design the governance form of their transportation chains from Spain to Norway. Should they do it themselves or should they outsource? Uh, <coughs> Economic supply incentives is that you, you are uh, you are trying to, to buy yourself uh, capacity even if you may have a, a low uh, order demand in certain periods of time. What I'm saying is that if you have <coughs> some critical components that you need from time to time and if the, the number of suppliers are limited, the product is highly specialized, you may need to actually buy something to keep the production going, to avoid stop and go and perhaps uh, bankruptcy at the, at the suppliers. We are actually negotiating now, as we speak, about a case like that. And the supplier is us. Uh, my research group is within transport economics. We have the responsibility for the modeling of transport uh, um, flows in Norway, which is complicated. It uh, requires a lot of specialized competence and a lot of, uh, of uh, computer programming to make those mathematical models run and to, to link the models to the empirical data, and so on and so forth. The problem is that the demand is going like this. You can have a top demand at certain periods, and then there is nothing for half a year. And this is an, a case from the service industry, research and development. And we cannot keep 10 people running idle for half a year at a time. We are not, uh, we cannot afford to do that. So we are now negotiating with our customers if they are, uh, are willing to keep this activity on planet so that it can be a continuous ongoing activity and not this stop and go thing. So it may have to do with uh, <coughs> 
buying certain quantities can also have to do with planning that the customers and the suppliers are, uh, are negotiating on uh, planning the, the production so that it goes uh, without the big tops and, uh, and uh, the fluctuation in, in demand, volatility in demand. Flexible transport goes without uh, saying. Dynamic pricing, we have tried to, I have mentioned that already. Uh, and assortment planning goes together with this. That you can use the price mechanism to, uh, to, uh, to influence customer choice and demand. And get rid of, of your product in time before they become obsolete. Um, some logistic, logistical implications of internalization. We have talked, <coughs> talked about some of this already. Uh, but there are some, some mega or superior questions that need to be asked. For instance, about inventory. Should it be central or local? Uh, it, sh how, how far should you, you take the product differentiation, customization? Because we, we learn, and you, uh, you will learn it, uh, those uh, who are taking the master's program in logistics, they will next week, not the next week, but the week after, they will learn about product variety. And they will learn that product variety is a good thing. Because product variety increases demand. You can, there is quite a lot of empirical evidence behind that. But it has a cost <coughs> connected to, uh, to, uh, to uh, inventory hold holding. Because if you have a lot of variants, you need to also be able to, to get them to the market. And that, that is very challenging. Handling, that has to do with, uh, with regulations. Then you are on the, on the transport chain. What kind of regulations do other countries have? Cultural differences. Uh, legal differences and so on. Localization, talk a bit about more about localization selection uh, during the next, next section, section. But uh, localization of production and of suppliers is, uh, is important. Goes together with regulations, goes together with factory prices and so on. Transport, infrastructure quality, and, uh, and uh, also the, the vessels that are, are used for, uh, for this. So this is um, a very compact description of how these, uh, these logistic chain, chains have shifted and, uh, and the design of the logistics chains, chains have shifted from 50 to 60 years ago, and up to today. Uh, <coughs> where there has been um, a trend towards globalization, uh, there has been um, a change in transport routes, which is perhaps our main concern, from being uh, continental within Europe, within the United States, within Japan, within Asia, uh, rest of Asia, not that much intercont. And then it starts to, to become increasingly intercontinental with the shipping routes and the air transport routes and, and so on. Um, we have the trade liberalization uh, going on, which uh, we dealt with on the first lecture. And <coughs> The whole thing became enthusi enthusiastically global during the 80s and 90s, where there was a very strong focus on, on real globalization. Whereas now we see this, uh, this uh, home shoring uh, start to gain momentum uh, because of there are many mechanisms, as I have told you before. One of them is an increase in, uh, in factor prices in other countries. Another one is uh, connected to uh, governance 
inf information asymmetry, uh, quality problems, and uh, things like that as, as a result. Uh, so, um, the nature of the flows, from physical distribution of finished products from, uh, from uh, product locations, new product locations. Whereas one here starts to get a increased uh, division of labor between different, uh, different regions, where some regions, some countries, uh, started to produce for assembly or production in other countries. And then now, as you will see in this, uh, this book chapter that I have posted, that, uh, that now the trend is, uh, is starting to, to reverse where uh, the, the traditionally high cost regions are, are taking some of the production back. But it doesn't happen like it used to be before in the, in the 50s and 60s. The, in Europe, in other high cost countries, we're talking about assembly production, where the supplies are taken from other countries in, in to, a, to a large extent. But when you are um, dealing with postponement, where you have, uh, where you have, um, where you don't produce anything until the order is placed, rather schematically, but that is the main difference. Whereas here, in the early days, one had all the production in, in, uh, domestically in one country or in, within a limited region, whereas here, the supplies may be distributed worldwide, assembly takes place in high-cost countries where they have control over the main production uh, facility and the main production processes, the quality control and everything connected to the, f to the, to the final product. So there is a big difference going on in terms of, uh, of thinking around uh, production. And now I'm talking about manufacturers, uh, manufactured production. Uh, not so much service. So, global consolidation, meaning big units on a bigger scale. Uh, <coughs> this we have talked about. Uh, bulk transportation by coordination of transport. And with bulk, I mean large quantities. Um, it may also be container transport, of course. So by consolidating, shipping in bigger, uh, shipping using bigger ships, uh, bigger units, you exploit the economies of advantages that I showed you there. So there is a focus on, uh, let's say, a reflective way of thinking about scale effects. And scale effects may be positive, and they may be negative. Negative scale effects are connected to, to let's say, these economies of size. There may be capacity issues that drives costs upwards. Maybe quality issues also. So it's complex. So. <coughs> The thing is, should one think in terms of, uh, of uh, centralization, continent-wise, Europe, or should one think in, in terms of local territories or local, local production, local factors? There is no single answer to that, because uh, it, it is a trade-off between inventory costs transport costs and the customer's needs for, uh, for, uh, for uh, lead time. High value products with a short lead time can well be stored uh, locally. 
they can even be stored almost anywhere as long as, uh, as you can uh, get hold of an aircraft. Because high value products, and the book mentions uh, microchip chips for uh, computers as one example. Another example is medicines, drugs for, uh, for hospitals and, uh, and doctors and things like that. So, so it's, it's a, it's a multi-dimensional problem, optimization problem, uh, to, to decide whether you should have uh, what kind of inventory uh, and manufacturing localization policy you should have. Demand volatility <coughs> affects this. And I've mentioned uh, these two. Um, demand volatility has to do with ups and downs in demand and, uh, and uh, how that affects your, your inventory policy. For, as an example, <coughs> if you take if you have time and you have volume like this and if you have a pattern in uh, in country number or country A <coughs> country A which goes something like this you see over time the demand varies like this okay and if you have, uh, this is uh, country A. And if you then have country B, which, uh, which goes something like this. There is a clear case for having a common let's say, warehouse or common inventory. Because you see, they are in, they are in, uh, in, uh, in a counter-cyclical pattern, demand pattern. So the, the resulting demand over time is fairly constant. And hence, it is <coughs> a common solution for, uh, for, uh, for inventory keeping and, and, uh, and if you like, production capacity. Is, uh, is proven if you if you manage to identify such such uh, cyclic and pattern and can combine them in in uh, in convenient ways you can uh, you can <coughs> save quite a lot of uh, of resources <coughs> this is just a simple illustration of of Europe where where uh, the scale effects and perhaps effects like this with the counter-cyclical demand can make it profitable for a, for a, let's say, a big multinational company to centralize inventory production to fewer centers that serves uh, a larger, serves larger markets. But also <coughs> transportation, transportation costs Customs, trade policies, uh, and down to labor costs and land use costs and everything are factors that need to be taken into consideration if you are going to go from here to here or vice versa. So there are scale effects on one hand, scale, uh, positive scale effects, and there are negative scale effects. This is just an illustration of, of this. If you have uh, the, the dimension here, dimensions here are distribution costs and inventory costs as a trade-off. Distribution costs, if they are uh, if they are uh, if they are high, and you have a demand for a shorter lead time. You, you may end up here with a local local inventory or local production 
facility close to the customers, closer to the customers. Whereas if you can live with a longer delivery time, uh, and you can do that for certain, certain items, let's say if it's, uh, if it's rather uh, standardized high volume products, like uh, elect electric equipment for, uh, for, uh, for domestic use, microwave ovens for instance, you can, you can live with a, a situation where you have uh, uh, a kind of a high centralization when it comes to, uh, to production facilities. And um, the volatility dimension has to do with the, with the illustration that I put up on, on, on the right hand side there. Uh, that will also contribute to a cent more centralized uh, localization of, of inventory and production. And you have <laughs> in between here, uh, international means uh, two or more countries, whereas continental means, means a large number of countries, a continent. Uh, and, uh, and the dimension here is also distance, of course, where this is supposed to have the longest distance to the market. But again, you need to address the, the localization on the basis of uh, customer needs, the cost profile, <coughs> and the demand. The, 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 let's say the, the shape of the aggre aggregated demand for, for the product. And you can also add, <coughs> um, you can also add uh, complementary products here. Whether you can, uh, if you know that one, the demand from, for one product is uh, reliant upon the demand for, for a, a complementary product, you can also take advantage of that when you plan, when you plan for, uh, for localization of production, if you are, are, uh, are making both uh, of those products, of course. I think we uh, just break there with that illustration before I continue quarter past. If there are n no questions, of course. I'm really tired of all the interruptions.